Welcome into the show, everybody. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzee Show, presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Great to have you along for the ride. Uh, my apologies to the live audience for being crazily late today, 28, 29 minutes late. Um, allergy suffers. Like, I don't even know. Like I Sometimes I check the air quality, and it's like, oh, it's perfect. It's pristine. And then my I wake up, and my eyes are burning. And no... If Mally's joining the show today, no, it's not smoking. If you got him for me, pal, never is. Oh, I'm crying. It's so emotional. Anyway, um, welcome in. Fletcher Cox officially calls it a career at the Novacare Complex. It's not officially official until you're at the Novacare Complex uh, reading your speech off your phone. That's the rule now. It's not officially over until you're reading your speech off your phone. I thought Fletcher was great yesterday. I I, if you got to know Fletcher Cox at all in his time in Philadelphia, it was a very Fletcher Cox matter of fact. Hey, by the way, that's a 12 year career. That's a six time pro bowl career. That's a one time all pro three time second team, all pro all decade super bowl winning career. All right. Next thing. Let's, let's party. Let's do the next thing. Just, I, I, I know throughout his career, there was some contract turmoil. Uh, I know throughout his career, some people criticized some of the sack numbers, some seasons. Like Fletcher Cox was the perfect example of like, go watch the film. Like, go watch the film. Nowadays, with NFL Plus, formerly NFL Game Pass, you can go back and you can watch the film. During the game, sometimes you get distracted by where the football is. One thing I've learned over the years is definitely watch the offensive and defensive line. Watch that and then watch the ball second. And watching Fletcher Cox in particular in the middle at defensive line, drawing double teams, creating opportunities for his guys on the outside time and time again, and him coming away with zero sacks. And it wasn't like he never got a sack in his career because he was obviously pretty dominant. But when it comes to that particular thing that a lot of people just brushed aside, that's something that Fletcher Cox did almost better than anybody in the NFL for over a decade. And he's one of the few players that going into a draft was like, I really hope. Really hope the Eagles are able to get this guy, and they got him, and they got Fletcher Cox uh, 12, almost 13 years ago. Um, so we'll get into what he had to say yesterday. He thanked somebody yesterday that, oddly enough, I never hear thanked. I, I, don't, I don't think Jason Kelsey thanked him. I can't think of anyone that's ever given this guy a shout out. And no, it's not Dom DeSandro who did get a thank you yesterday. We'll let you hear that. I will also let you hear about Fletcher Cox when he talks about his legacy. He does go on to talk about, you know, impacting the young players and how the older players when he got into the league were really helping him. He says something really amazing about D'Amico Ryan's um, head coach now, the Houston Texans. So we're going get to get into that conversation. The 76ers were our only saving grace last night, ladies and gentlemen. The 76ers were our only saving grace. Flyers lost horribly 9-3. And the, uh, the Phillies, again, just, uh, oh, Zach Wheeler's pitching? No run support whatsoever. That's the way that shook out. JT Romuto took a ball to the throat yesterday. Took a bouncer to the throat. Came out of the game. Left the game. You know it's a real deal if the real Muto is is uh, leaving the game. And after the game, uh, for anyone who didn't see it because it was on NBC Sports Philadelphia app, my used to be the My Teams app, whatever it is now. Uh, for anyone who didn't see it, we'll go through some of the game and just let you know what went down, including one particular thing that I even talked about on yesterday's show that you never see really from a starting pitcher anymore. And you saw it yesterday, and a guy making his first start of the season. Um, and coming off a uh, – it was calf strain, I believe it was, for Sonny Gray. Yeah, we'll get into it. Uh, but JT Romuto, after the game, um, Rob Thompson came out and said that he had a little headache as well. Uh, did not test positive for a concussion, so no concussion for JT Romuto. But you could tell when he got hit, he was shook it up. He was shaken up a bit. So that's the way that went down yesterday. He had to come out of the game. Phillies ended up uh, taking the L anyway, 3 nothing. As I said, no run support for Zach Wheeler. Um, the 76ers with Joel Embiid, no Tyrese Maxey last night. Night off, hip tightness again. I'm sure they're just being extra cautious. Also, uh, they were playing the Pistons. 
All right. So it was a little bit of a G League opponent in front of the 76ers last night. I don't really feel like they thought they needed Kyle Lowry or they needed Tyrese Maxey. They could come away with a victory with just Joel Embiid. I think they could do just fine with just the reigning MVP of the NBA. And they did for the most part. There was one or two instances last night I was like, oh, this isn't good. This isn't good. And most of that came in that third quarter. And then of all people, Jeff Doughton came up huge for the Sixers. It was his turn, I guess. Ricky Council, the, the fourth, stepped up the other night against San Antonio. Uh, K.J. Martin helped the, the Sixers out tremendously in their uh, uh, win over the, the Miami Heat and uh, put in some good minutes there against the Grizzlies as well. But the Sixers pretty much handled their business against the Memphis Grizzlies. Anyway, um, it was pretty great uh, what you saw. Uh, last night in particular from another guy off the end of the bench in Jeff Dowden. So we'll get into that conversation, uh, especially when you talk about Joel Embiid dropping 37, 37 points in 36 minutes, the most minutes he's logged since coming back from his meniscus injury. So let's get into it all. First and foremost, Fletcher Cox yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, officially announcing his retirement. Here are the, the leading thank yous for Fletcher Cox. One name never gets mentioned, got mentioned here, but here's Fletch yesterday. Well, today's the day, uh, and I know it's April, whatever it is, and uh, I wish this was an April Fool's joke, but it's not. It's real. Um, first off, you know, I want to thank uh, Mr. Lurie, uh, you know, obviously for changing my life, you know, drafting me back in 2012, um, and obviously, you know, been here 10-plus um, years um, in the city of Philadelphia, um, changed my life, my family's life, and, you know, everybody around me. Uh, secondly, Howie, um, he's a big part of, you know, my success also. Um, just, you know, trading up spots to draft me. Um, and obviously, um, Coach Wash was in his ear during the whole draft process about how bad he wanted me to be an eagle and how bad he wanted to coach me. And, you know, Howie, um, you know, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Don, uh, the president, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you've been a big part of, you know, me being here the whole time, um, and it's, it's been very special. Big Dom, Paisan, always, you're my guy. Um, to every coach, uh, you know, that's, that's, I've been a part of staff and everybody, um, you know, it's been important to me, you know, these, you know, this, this 12 years, and, you know, even back to high school, Coach Wolfhawk, uh, you know, I can, I can keep going. Coach Wallace, you know, guys that was so important to me um, during my career early on, and, you know, and, and those things that you don't forget, you know, lifetime's a long time. And, you know, I learned that, you know, from a good buddy of mine. And, and it's, it's true. It is ab absolutely true. Um, not all the people you would expect to, to be thanked. But what's really wild is that Don, what, what do you call him? Dom Paisan, Paisan Dom, whatever he called him. Great. I've heard Dom DeSandro get thanked. Jason Kelsey thanked Dom DeSandro. Uh, I have never heard anyone thank Don Smolinski, the president of the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, before the president of the Philadelphia Eagles was Don Smolinski, it was Joe Banner. And I remember distinctly the Eagles at the time, I thought this is the polar opposite. Joe Banner had gotten a horrible reputation in the city of Philadelphia, despite the most successful run the Eagles had, sustained success without a Super Bowl, but sustained success the Eagles had. And Joe Banner was a key piece in that. He was a key cog in that wheel. But because he was just looked at as a money man and a guy that uh, wouldn't pay a linebacker, wouldn't pay Jeremiah Trotter, senior, uh, everyone looked at him like, ah, oh, this guy, he's just, he's just, everyone's a price tag out there. There's no players. He just looks at price tags, you know, that kind of thing. Didn't pay T.O. and all that stuff. So a lot of people didn't like Joe Banner by the time the, the at the end rolled around. He had lost a power struggle with Andy Reid. He eventually lost a power struggle apparently with Howie Roseman, the guy that he groomed the entire time, and then Howie Roseman ended up taking over and then winning that Super Bowl. But Joe Banner had this horrible reputation by the time things were over in Philadelphia for him. And then Don, uh, Don Smolinski, Don Smolinski ended up taking over. And he was like the most lovable guy you could ever imagine. And he would never meddle in team and does never meddle in team operations. So I love that Fletcher Cox shouted him out because he's a, he's a businessman and he acknowledges it as a businessman. And if you ever get a chance to meet Don Smolinski, he's one of the nicest human beings you could ever come across. Polar opposite. Very warm guy. Polar opposite to Joe Banner. So I love that he got a little hat tip there from Fletcher Cox yesterday. Uh, also, 
I love that, the, that these guys are always thanking their high school coaches. Jason Kelsey thanked his high school coaches. Jason Kelsey thanked his high school band leader. And then Fletcher Cox goes out there yesterday and talks about um, his uh, high school coach and how much he helped him. Like, it's, it's really amazing how much how impactful. And you think back, and like, of course, right? But just to get that shout out at the moment where it's all over, they're thinking about where they came from. It's a, it's an awesome thing. And if you didn't see the picture, the Eagles even put it out yesterday. Or Jeff McClain, I'm sorry. Jeff McClain put it out there yesterday. Uh, Fletcher Cox's like, entire family came out to see him off uh, and call it a career at the Novacare Complex, which which was just absolutely incredible. And I, I talked to you guys at the time that he, he announced it on Instagram that he was retiring, on social media that he was retiring. Uh, the one play that I think of with Fletcher Cox above everything else, because it just kind of described the player that he was, was forcing that scoop and score the year they won the Super Bowl uh, against the Washington, uh, was it the football team at the time? I can't remember. Uh, forcing that in the early goings of the game, kind of just, it set the tone for every time the Eagles were down or it looked like the Eagles were going to lose and the defense was the one in the third or fourth quarter to come up with that big turnover and put things back into motion for the momentum of the Philadelphia Eagles. And that, I feel like, set the tone for the entire season. And even in the Super Bowl, with the best example of that being Brandon Graham's strip sack of Tom Brady. And I remember even in that moment thinking, like, oh, it's been since the beginning of the year. Fletcher Cox forced that fumble. And now, you know, though, you go through the entire year, you're forcing fumbles, you're making turnovers, you're, you're picking up passes and all that stuff. Th this is what the Eagles do. This is what their defense does. They come up clutch, baby. And I remember thinking in that fourth quarter against the Patriots, you know, now's about that time to get that Eagles uh, game-changing turnover, momentum-changing turnover. And sure enough, they got it. And that one was from Brandon Graham and uh, also from Derek Barnett. Of course, who fell on it? Um, speaking of people, I did not expect to hear the name dropped yesterday. Don Smolinski being one, Derek Barnett being another. Didn't expect that, but apparently him and Fletcher, Co Fletcher Cox grew to be extremely close during their time together in Philadelphia. Okay. Talent level wise in Philadelphia, you wouldn't see it coming. Background story wise, I guess you would, as Fletcher Cox alluded to yesterday. They both came from the same place. Both came from a very similar story. The same story, as a matter of fact. Didn't even use the word similar. Same story. Uh, I won't speculate as to everything that surrounds that, but um, pretty amazing that a teammate like that got shouted out by Fletcher Cox. A couple other things. When he was looking back on his legacy, he did talk about um, how he wants to be remembered as a Philadelphia Eagle. When people look back at my career, you know, the biggest thing is I want them to look at the way that I played the game. The, the, the honest way I played the game, um, the way I went out, um, the way that, you know, they looked at my leadership, um, even the younger guys, you know, I still want those guys to call me for leadership advice. Um, and that's what I want to be looked at as. Uh, you, you If you're going to be a lifeline, he said to the cafeteria guys yesterday when he went in and thanked all the staffers at the Novacare Complex, uh, it's not uh, goodbye, it's see you later. I always love that line, you know. Um, and I feel like it, and I'm glad that it it's going to apply here. I feel like the same thing with Jason Kelsey, as uh, Todd Harriman's even told us. That he's got a feeling that Jason Kelsey is going to be around that team a lot. Maybe Fletcher Cox will be as well, and maybe they'll need it because if Fletcher Cox is going to be a lifeline, Jalen Carter better be calling that lifeline. Jordan Davis better be calling that lifeline. I would love for Fletcher Cox to be around that Novacare complex as much as humanly possible this upcoming season to help a lot of the young guys on this team. Even a guy like Bryce Huff, did they play the same position? No, obviously not. But you, do you want to know about playing in Philadelphia? Fletcher Cox, pretty good guy to talk to about playing in Philadelphia. Better have thick skin if you're going to come here to Philadelphia. said that yesterday as well. And it's absolutely true. As they say, Philly ain't for everybody. Uh, but, man, if, if you're for Philly, they'll love you forever. They will love you forever. And if you're going to be a young guy in this uh, defensive line and you're going to be looking to take the next step and you're looking to become a leader in your own right, uh, what better lifeline to have than Fletcher Cox? He went on to talk about that, about how his legacy will live on than some of the younger guys on this defensive line. That's exactly what you want to hear from a guy that no longer on the team will still look to be a leader. That's something, that's something that just doesn't go away if you're a true leader. 
That's something that doesn't go away. One of my favorite parts of the press conference was when he got asked about who's going to keep Brandon Graham in check. Who's going to keep him quiet? And he said, <clears throat> you know, maybe, maybe they should put a little buzzer on Brandon Graham, like on his shoulder or something. If he's talking too much, they just hit the button. And like, it's basically a shock collar. You're talking about a shock collar for Brandon Graham. Just, just, just watch you back it off there, uh, Brandon, BG. There was a great mic'd up segment. When the Eagles played in San Francisco some years ago, I want to say it was 2019, where Brandon Graham was mic'd up and he kept on talking all that trash. So in other words, Brandon Graham was Brandon Graham. And it was later in the game. I want to say it was about the third quarter. Things were getting a little tense. Things were getting a little tight. But BG just keeps on talking. And at one point, Fletcher Cox goes, all right, that's enough now. And BG just goes, all right. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's the relationship between the two. Uh, love it. Absolutely love it. One of the things he mentioned with D'Amico Ryans uh, when he was talking about how long he's been in the league and everything is like a teammate of mine is now a head coach in the NFL. And that's got to be a pretty cool thing. I didn't, just didn't, you know, one of those things you just don't put together. But uh, a teammate of his is now a head coach in the NFL in D'Amico Ryans. And part of me was like, is he going to be a coach? Is Fletcher Cox going to come back and be a coach at some point? Is that something he's eyeing up? Hmm. Interesting. Just something. He, he's made enough money in his career. I don't think he needs to by any means, but it's something interesting, something, food for thought. Um, but he also talked about how D'Amico Ryans influenced his career and said, because remember, go from a 4-3 to a 3-4. When Chip Kelly came in here with Billy Davis, that's the defense they ran, and they went, went back to a 4-3, and then they went to a 4-3-4 four, four, four under, and now it looks like with Vic Fangio, a little bit more 3-4 there. So it's something that, you don't think about too often in changing schemes, but he said, whoever comes in here, and this is something I learned from D'Amico Ryans, whoever comes in here, whatever scheme they bring, whatever philosophy they bring, great players find a way to be successful. There's no excuses. There's no, this isn't my scheme. This isn't my philosophy. This doesn't it'll lend itself to where I'm at the best of my abilities. This doesn't lend itself to my game or what makes me special. But if I'm a great player, I'm going to find a way to win. 70 sacks in total on this, uh, in his career. As I mentioned earlier, six-time All-Pro. Uh, excuse me, six-time Pro Bowler. Uh, One-time All-Pro, three-time second-team All-Pro, and All-Decade for the 2010s and a Super Bowl victory. He admitted that Hall of Fame is on his mind. It's something that would, of course, be incredible. Uh, you have Aaron Donald, who also just called it a career. I think he's the best defensive lineman uh, of his generation. And I think right after that, uh, you're talking about guys like J.J. Watt. I think you're talking about uh, Fletcher Cox. Those are the guys you're talking about in terms of interior, or excuse me, in terms of defensive linemen. Uh, is particularly if you're talking about interior defensive linemen, Aaron Donald, Fletcher Cox. Yeah, those guys are the guys that I would put in that conversation. Talking about from this era, oh yeah, Hall of Famer. He's certainly in the conversation. Uh, I think he gets in. I don't think he's a first ballot. I think down the line he'll get in. The thing that we got to keep in mind, and this is something that we're not used to factoring in at all in Philadelphia, is winning a Super Bowl and being a leader on a Super Bowl team. And when you talk about a defensive tackle, getting 70 sacks in his career, yeah, that's pretty damn good. That's pretty good. He also said, first, I got to get in the Eagles Hall of Fame. That would help my case to get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame if I get in the Eagles Hall of Fame first. Uh, look, we, we know that Jason Kelsey retiring leaves a huge void on the offense in terms of leadership, in terms of presence in the locker room and all that stuff. But I feel like all of us are pretty confident in Cam Jurgens' abilities. Whether or not Nick Sirianni is going to name him the center at any point before the regular season actually starts, which, by the way, the rumor in Brazil is now that the Packers are going to be the team the Eagles face. See what comes out of that, but that's just like the latest rumor now. But I feel like Skill-wise, talent-wise, most people feel like the Eagles are still going to be pretty solid at the center position. Maybe not Hall of Fame-worthy right out of the gate, but still pretty solid at the center position without Jason Kelsey being here. 
when it comes to the defensive line, I don't think anyone really knows. We have confidence. I think that you know Jalen Carter is going to be pretty good. But if you're running this Vic Fangio defense, you might see him kicked out to an edge rusher position. I mean, I should say you know D end position. Um, with Jordan Davis being that nose tackle, more of that Fletcher Cox role, I guess. That's what you're going to be looking at here uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles defense. So I think there's still a lot more question marks on who's going to be filling voids defensively speaking as opposed to on the offensive side of things. So Fletcher Cox stepping aside definitely makes a few more questions pop up when it comes to what this Eagles defense is going to do and how much success they're going to have in the upcoming season. I think we all know the talent level of Jordan Davis. I think we all know the talent level of Jalen Carter. It's a matter of how they're going to keep that up throughout an entire season. 17 games. Games 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. That's where it, or excuse me, yeah, 17, sorry. Uh, that's where you start to have weeks. 16, 17, 18. That's where you start to really be like, all right, they, they still up for the they still up to stuff here. They still gonna have a high level of play, or are they are they done already? Are they ready for the hot tub? They might be ready for the hot tub. We'll look at the season as a year where they take that step forward. That's what uh, that's who will be under the microscope when it comes to this Philadelphia Eagles defense without Fletcher Cox. Uh, all in all, that was a really great speech. Thought he honored everybody that he needed to honor yesterday. And from a talent perspective, and yes, from a leadership perspective, Fletcher Cox will be missed terribly next year. Hopefully not too terribly. But I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. Uh, if there's a play, if, there, if there's a play for Fletcher Cox, I'd love to see it in the comments. Uh, one that you think of when you think of Fletcher Cox uh, in his playing career. Philadelphia 76ers. Before we go into that and what happened in the game, let's just look at where we're at right now. Looking at the standings, the Knicks right now are still two and a half games ahead of the Sixers for that third spot. Not happening. Magic are a game and a half up on the Sixers. Yeah. <laughs> they lose they lose two, maybe. Two games left in the season for the Sixers. Uh, the Cavs also two, uh, excuse me, a game and a half up there on the Sixers. The Pacers won again last night. They're still a full game up on the Sixers. Sixers, I believe, on the yeah, Sixers on the tie break there. So maybe you know you win your last two, Pacers lose one, and you're gold, baby. You're gold. Sixers, by the way, playing the Magic tomorrow night. And the Miami Heat won last night as well, so they stay a half game behind the Sixers in the Eastern Conference standings. Sixers and Heat still in the play-in tournament as of right now. Going into the game last night, it gets announced that Tyrese Maxey is not playing because of hip stiff, uh, stiffness, as I mentioned. You're talking about a guy that you don't, you shouldn't need Tyrese Maxey to beat the Detroit Pistons. There's a couple, there, like I said, there's one moment where it was a little, little close, a little tight. Uh, Kyle Lowry continued to get some time off as well. I assume that the Sixers are just being very cautious with both of these guards down the stretch. Joel Embiid goes out there last night, though, plays the most minutes he's played since he's returned, 36 in total. In the first quarter, he was as close to his old ways as you could be in terms of minutes logged. Uh, Nick Nurse actually had him go out there and play until 314 of the first quarter, which is the most he's played in a first quarter since coming back from the injury. Then in the second quarter, they did a lot of the same thing. They took him out around the 305 mark and actually put him back in around the one minute mark. So he actually finished uh, and played more in that second quarter. Uh, third quarter, pretty dominant. Fourth quarter, he came out, I think, around the 740 mark and then never had to play again. And still logged 36 minutes, 36 minutes in last night's game. Dropping 37 points, pulling down 11 rebounds, so another 30-point double-double for Joel Embiid, not too shabby, and eight assists. At the half, Joel Embiid led all scorers with 20 points, and he led all assisters, question marks? Uh, he led them with a, a, a seven. Not bad, Joel. Six, excuse me, six. Not bad, Joel Embiid. Not bad at all. And it was the passing for me that stole the show. Backdoor cut on the baseline with uh, uh, Nico Batum. Hits him in stride perfectly. Let him. Uh, easy two points right there. Tobias Harris, a little give and go at the top of the key. Beautiful bounce pass. Great precision. Tobias Harris gets an easy slam out of it. Yeah, Toby was back in the lineup after a week off. He threw it down. Had 15 points in total in the game. Nice to see that. 
Uh, and it was just time and time again, Joel Embiid was able to find his teammates. If you remember before the season, we we're all talking about, can Joel Embiid develop that part of his game? We we're all on our Joker high after uh, Nikola Jokic was going out there and uh, winning a championship last year. Uh, Joel Embiid finally wins the MVP award. Joker shows up in the playoffs. JoJo doesn't, unfortunately. And we all know how it ended. But one of the things we took away from it was if JoJo comes back, if Joel Embiid comes back, which he likely would with the Sixers, and he did, you want to see him just develop that part of his game. Get his teammates a little bit more involved to the point where he doesn't have to play hero ball all the time. It's not going to all come down to him. Have guys you can rely on. And it was one of the things I looked at last night. Uh, it, it reminded me of going into the game last night. Coming back from the injury, a lot of new faces with Kyle Lowry now being here, Buddy Heald being here. You had played well with Kelly Oubre, but now there's a new version of Kelly Oubre that we're seeing that is absolutely fantastic in terms of his aggression going to a whole new level, attacking the basket, and coming up clutch, and being a giant spark plug for this team when they need it. Was Joel Embiid going to fit in nicely? Well, first off, everyone fits into Joel Embiid. He's the MVP. He's your best player. People fit into him. Secondly, this, it's not like bringing in Al Horford and Joel Embiid has to find a new way to play. No. Oh, and also with a point guard and Ben Simmons, and all he's doing is either attacking the rim or trying to get rebounds away from Joel Embiid. That's, that's not what's going on here. These are guys that you kick the ball out to. This is easy. Compared to what's going on in the past, these are guys that you kick the ball out to. And these are, these are guys that aren't demanding the ball as much as a James Harden, for instance. So for me, this is just, should be a fairly easy transition for Joel Embiid, and so far it has been. Six consecutive wins now with the Sixers. Uh, Joel Embiid, another over 20-point performance. Uh, his second over 30-minute performance since coming back from the meniscus. It all just looks really easy, and watching him distribute the basketball last night was my favorite part of his game. Sure, the falling down hook throw shot, whatever the heck that was, that was pretty incredible, and that was fun to watch too. Uh, no foul call on that. Tyrese Maxey seemed to have an issue with that on the sideline. But uh, as the game went on yesterday, I just I was dazzled by the way he was hitting his teammates and getting them involved in the game. Yeah, yeah 37 points is also nice. Getting to the free throw line is also nice, but I've seen him do that plenty of times. What I haven't seen him do enough was go out there and hit his teammates the way he was able to. Uh, and it also, a guy like Buddy Heald made it easy, knocking down five threes for the Sixers. It was great. And an unsung hero, if I may, in last night's game, K.J. Martin gave you good minutes over the last stretch of games here. Um Ricky Council, the fourth, has given you good minutes over the last stretch of games here, especially against the Spurs. Nick Nurse, this is something that you just didn't get with Doc Rivers. And I love, absolutely love what we're getting from uh, Nick Nurse and the way he's using some of the younger or more inexperienced guys off the end of the bench in these games late in the season. Jeff Doughton goes out there. Now, this is the interesting thing here. So the 13-win Pistons are starting to give the Sixers a run for their money in that third quarter. Ivy was knocking down threes for him. Sasser was knocking down threes for him. And at one point, Sasser hit a three, and it was a 9-0 run. All right? It was a 9-0 run for the uh, Detroit Pistons. They had made it a 71-70 to game. Sixers leading by one point. Kelly Oubre had just gone to the locker room. Got shooken up a little bit, came back into the game. It all was right there. But Dalton comes up with a steal and goes the other way. By this time, the Sixers had started to establish a little bit more momentum for themselves. But Dalton getting that steal uh, in midway through the third quarter with about seven minutes left and then getting the and one down the other end, ended up missing the, 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 the free throw. But still getting that steal and two points the other way made it a 81-72 to 72 game in favor of the Sixers. And then after that, it was like the Sixers just completely took over. They ended that third quarter. Since it was a 71-70 to 70 game, they ended the third quarter on a 19-8 to 8 run. They took control back. Kelly Oubre uh, came up with a big block on Wiseman down below, uh, grabbed the rebound, flexed a little bit as well. Dowden came down with another driving layup high off the glass. Another big two points for him. Dowden made it an 83-74 to 74 game. Heald hit a corner three. Oubre with a driving layup. 88-76 to 76 before you could blink with the Sixers just taking full control of the game yet again, and they never lost control after that. That's 
a lot of it was Kelly Oubre again. A lot of it was Jeff Doughton. Jeff Doughton Jr. And that's someone that we haven't even talked about this year. And Nick Nurse is like, all right, fella, get in there. Let's see what you got. And he came in and he gave you good minutes. Eight points in 21 minutes for the Sixers last night is what Jeff Doughton gave you. Gave you. Are you going to see him in the playoffs? No, but you might. You might. To see these guys getting, it's not like the Sixers have a number one seed locked up here. It's not like they were up 20 points with a minute left and they're like, all right, let's get these guys some run. 21 minutes of play. What, 24 from Ricky Council the other night in San Antonio? This is stuff you see from Nick Nurse that you never saw from uh, Doc Rivers. If you saw it at all, it was begrudgingly from Doc Rivers. I'll give the young guys a chance. We had the scratch and claw for Tyrese Maxey. Ben Simmons had to be one of the biggest prima donnas in prima donna history in order for Tyrese Maxey to get some, some substantial run. Thanks, Doc, Duck, Glenn, if you will. Uh, one horrifyingly scary moment last night. Right before that run the Sixers went on, actually it was right before the run that the um, – the, the Raptors went on in the third quarter there. In, in the midst of the 9-0 run, I think it's fair to say. Right before Sasser hit that three to make it a one-point game. Joel Embiid went after a ball that was going out of bounds. I believe it was off the hands of Nico Batum. Joel Embiid went after the ball, stepped on the line, and it looked like his left knee <laughs> buckled a little bit. He went down. You saw the expression. I was like, oh, God. You know, went down and was was had the agony face for a second. And then he got up and, and was fine. <laughs> he played uh, 10 more minutes in the game. He, he had logged 23 minutes at the time. He went on to play. No, there should be 13 minutes. Logged another 13 minutes of play. Was very productive in that time. But in that moment, <laughs> I, I told you many times, I'm not the guy that goes, every time that Joel Embiid hits the ground, I don't go, oh, God, no, something horrible is going to happen. No, but in this moment, I went, oh, my God, something horrible is going to happen. And he was fine. Played 13 more minutes, was very productive, did everything he did before it, and did everything again after it. Everything was great. Everything was grand. Everything was lovely. But in that moment, uh, <laughs> because I'll, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again. This is the best version of the 76ers I've seen since Jimmy Butler. I have. I think this is the best team since that team. The team that got quadruple doinked out of the playoffs, that's still the best post-Iverson team I've seen. This team is the closest to that. With Tyrese Maxey playing at the level he's playing at, even with yesterday off, Tyrese Maxey being at the level he's at, Kelly Oubre, Kelly Oubre contributing. Buddy Heel gets hot. Buddy Heel gets hot. A 5-3 night, a 5 of 9 shooting from beyond the arc last night, 18 points. You love to see it. D'Anthony Melton coming back, getting his first action since February and looking damn well, damn good on the court yesterday didn't light it up or blow it up by any means but still just to get his defense back out there get his, get his shooting back out there all was right with the world as far as the anthony mountain went he'll work his way back of course all that uh but this to me and this coaching this is the best version of that team since jimmy butler i don't think it's even close and you know maybe you get a different ending here Maybe you crawl up in the standings just a little bit to get out of that play-in tournament and you help yourself just a little bit. And maybe, just maybe, the chips actually fall, the cards actually fall where they should, and you make it out of the second round, you make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and then we have something better to talk about other than a second-round playoff exit. I don't know if they're championship-ready yet. I'd love to think that they are. But how about this? Staying in the NBA... Oh my goodness gracious, the Bucs and Celtics battled last night. The Bucs won the game. Giannis left the game early with a calf strain. We'll be monitoring the situation. And in that game, two free throws. Two free throws in the entire game. The Boston Celtics in last night's game did not, uh, I don't think they attempted a free throw. I think both were by the Bucs. As a matter of fact, let me confirm that uh, because it, that is insane. 104-91 win for the Bucks, And in total, 
See if I can get this real quick. Yeah, the Bucs took the win, yeah, obviously. Uh, the Celtics, no free throw attempts for the Celtics. The only Buck, the only player in the game to attempt free throws was Giannis Antetokounmpo, and he only made one. One for two. 15 points, 29 minutes logged before the calf strain. Patrick Beverly led the team in scoring with 20. And for the Celtics, not a great night for the Celtics. Uh, 32% from beyond the arc. Jason Tatum scored 22 points. As a team, they shot just under 40%. Uh, so the Bucs have now lost only six of their last 10 games. So how about that? Congratulations to the Bucs on that success. Uh, but that's where that's where they're at right now. Uh, Sixers will be playing host to the Orlando Magic tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. That's the way that shapes up for everything else. Uh, moving on to the world of baseball. Phillies, 3-0 loss. Zach Wheeler, no run support last night. And I mentioned this earlier, and I'll get to it again. Sonny Gray makes his first start of the season coming back from, uh, I believe it was that calf strain. He's at 63 pitches. They have a mound conference. He's in a little bit of trouble. They have a mound conference, him at 63 pitches. They set a hard number for Sonny Gray in last night's game, did the Cardinals, for him to not go over 65 pitches. Fifth inning, runners on, 63 pitches. They have a mound conference. Looked like they wanted to take him out of the game. And Sonny Gray's like, yeah, no, I'm going to. I'm going to finish this off. Sure enough, I believe it was two pitches later. Oh, excuse me. One pitch later gets the 6-4-3 double play, gets out of the inning. That's a, a pitcher that I, I was talking about yesterday that stays in the game. Spencer Turnbull, tired apparently, wanted to leave the game. Bullpen has to come in an inning early. You end up getting eaten alive in the ninth inning to force extras. You won the game, fine, but I'm talking about philosophy. I'm not talking about result. I like a pitcher arguing to stay in the game. If you know you're done, I guess you know you're done, but I'd rather you say, no, I got more in me. I can, I can do this. Yeah. And uh, Sonny Gray said that last night, and he, he got the win. Five innings logged yesterday. Uh, first start, one win. Zach Wheeler, three starts, no wins. Two losses. Great. And Zach Wheeler also gave you seven innings of work in last night's loss. 107 pitches for Zach Wheeler. Six hits. Three runs all earned. Two of the hits, uh, dink and dunks. The runs. Gorman took him deep on a very legit home run. 94-mile-per-hour fastball he put in the center field. And uh, everything else was... Just crap offensively. I will say Nick Cassianos is a guy that, as I was mentioning yesterday, I don't have a lot of confidence in him turning it around. Yeah, fine. Good to hear that he was at the ballpark early, really early yesterday. Was hitting, I think he hit two buckets of baseballs. According to, I think it was the Cardinals broadcast that even put that out there. And then he at least responded by a two-hit night, two for four on the evening. His average jumps up from 113 to 154. Uh, Johan Rojas. Uh, only credited with one at bat last night. So his average only dropped 0 for 1 in that one at bat. And his average only dropped to 148, from 154 to 148. So, you know, still looking up for Johan Rojas. Also worth mentioning, Trey Turner last night, 2 for 3, stole his 39th consecutive base. Nobody's done that since Jimmy Rollins in uh, 08 to 09, I believe, or 07 to 08. I can't remember, but uh, it's been a while since that's been done. 39 consecutive stolen bases for Trey Turner. Phillies will be back at it this afternoon, looking to win their second consecutive series. Uh, and it'll be a 135 start time, I believe it is today, for the Phillies. Um, 115, excuse me, 115 start time as they wrap up this six game road trip and three game series in St. Louis. On the mound for the Phils today will be Aaron Nola. That's who will break it down. Real quick on the Flyers, they lost 9-3. to 
John Tortorella is completely, he just he seems befuddled at, at this point. I don't, there was no, what do you remind? I said he feels bad for his team, how hard they played through the season. And now recently, this is the way they're ending it. <laughs> yeah, they're cooked, unfortunately. They're cooked. They're very much cooked. Uh, one point of controversy. I got to get back to this before I get into the chat uh, in the world of baseball. Reese Hoskins was on with Eric Kratz, former Phillies uh, catcher, Eric Kratz. Yes, uh, Godshall Turkey Bacon fame, Eric Kratz. Uh, was on uh, his uh, po podcast and web show. And Kratz, he asked him about his return to Philadelphia. The Brewers are going to come to Philadelphia in June. June 3rd, they start a three-game series in Philly. And that'll be Reese Hoskins' first time back in Philly as a member of the Brewers. Eric Kratz asked him, do you think you're going to get booed? What kind of reception? Do you think you're going to get booed in Philadelphia? And Reese Hoskins said, yeah, <laughs> probably. I'm probably going to get booed. Let me make this abundantly clear. There is no way in hell Reese Hoskins is getting anything other than a standing ovation when he comes back to Citizens Bank Park on June 3rd, and he's probably going to get it every day that he's back. Every day. And I have I stuck up for Reese Hoskins. I acknowledge what he was and what he is as a baseball player. He is not a, a franchise changing, altering guy. He is not a guy that's going to carry you into the playoffs. He was a great leader while he was here in Philadelphia, but he was no near, nowhere near the talent some people built him up to be in their heads. Reese Hoskins made me think of a phrase that I have coined. It is the fake take. And that is, oh, everyone says Reese Hoskins is the greatest thing. Nobody says Reese Hoskins is the greatest thing. Did his incredible 11 home runs in 18 games is that absolutely bonkers when he first came up? Yes, it was absolutely bonkers. Did people then expect him to hit 50 home runs for the next 10 years? If you did, that's crazy talk. But people built him up because of that start, I think, and created this fake take about him that just was never real. I think the, the Phillies did him a disservice. I think it was three different batting coaches and, what, three different managers in the first uh, four years of his career, like all with different approaches. I thought he had a great approach when he came to the big leagues. I, I remember I, I couldn't wait the, until he came up into the big leagues and started to put that power on display, started to show that approach at the plate that he had, being able to work a walk, not being afraid of an 0-2 count. And he worked counts tremendously. At times, I thought he was a little too passive and a little, maybe a little bit more aggression at the plate. Go ahead and if you get that first pitch fastball, if you're if you have a pitcher that's notorious for giving that first pitch fastball or whatever that first pitch might be, jump on it, man. Put it in the left field stands. And then the Gabe Kapler regime, that didn't go so great. Uh, and it wasn't good. It was not good. No bueno. No bueno. And then uh injuries unfortunately uh took their toll on him. But still, he was a, a hugely even with Bryce Harper on this team a huge leader in the clubhouse for the Phillies. He was there for the transition. Here through a transition like what the Phillies went through or what the Sixers went through, even though the Sixers was intentional, unfortunately. Uh, I really admire guys like that to kind of see things through, and he saw things through from the really bad years to making it to a World Series, to being two wins shy of a World Series. And one thing that I still, uh, and this isn't, any, this isn't my feeling, this is what players have told me, that Reese Hoskins was a phenomenal leader in that clubhouse. And even with Bryce Harper here, he was a phenomenal leader in that clubhouse. I know some people look at it and they go, oh, no way. Now, I'm not talking about from a fan's perspective. I'm talking about from a player's perspective, how much they respected Reese Hoskins. And also a guy, any chance I got to interview Reese Hoskins, just absolute gentleman and professional. And always appreciated the uh, time I got uh, with Reese Hoskins. So when he comes back to Philadelphia in that series, does anyone actually think he's going to get booed? Like, I know people that really don't like Reese Hoskins, but they will applaud him because they at least acknowledge what he was here for as a Philly and the role he played on that team that made it to a World Series, won a National League championship. And let's face it, 
I don't think anyone will ever be the Mets daddy more than Chase Utley. But if they had a stepdad, it's Reese Hoskins. Like, let's just put it that way. I mean, I know the bat spike is incredible. And I mean, yeah, if you're being real, that is the by far the best moment that Reese Hoskins had as a Philadelphia Philly. And speaking of which, I was at that game. He did the bat spike. And uh, the first game there against uh, the Braves, first playoff game in CBP in 11 years. And I'm sitting next to my dad, who is not uh, a Reese Hoskins fan. My dad and my brother and I went to the game. My dad is one of the guys that does not like Reese Hoskins. And uh, I'm like, home. I'm like, he's going deep. He's going deep. He's going to get a first pitch fastball and jump on it. First pitch fastball, jumped on it, bat spike. I looked at my dad. I was like, oh. Do that to my dad because you know, I, respect, I respect my father. Uh, that I just did it for the people on the podcast. I just did a crying face. Anyway, um, a mocking crying face for the people on the podcast towards my dad. Anyway, I, uh, I do that. And uh, that was great. It was a phenomenal moment. But my favorite moment, that was the best moment, but my personal favorite. <laughs> uh, home run of the playoffs, pretty awesome. Uh, my favorite, my personal favorite was uh, trolling the New York Mets with the slow trot around the bases. The Mets had thrown at him a couple times. Reese Hoskins, of course, had took a, taken an exception to it, as anybody would, you know. They threw at him just one too many times. He belts a home run down the left field line. And I, I don't know why the number 23 jumps out in my head, but I believe it was 23 seconds to round the bases. It reminded me of that uh, viral clip of the Little League kid who was trying to run in slow motion or did run in slow motion from third base to home. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I thought that is the best troll job. Other than like Chase Utley with a hard slide at second base, uh, breaking Ruben Tejeda, knock on woods, uh, uh, leg in half. That was one of the greatest moments. Um, uh, should be trolling moments for Mets fans to always hold against the Phillies. One a hell of a lot more serious than the other. So not greatest. Sorry about that. Uh, but in terms of moments where you're trolling Mets fans and pissing off Mets fans the most, that's the moment right there that I look at. So, uh, for that reason and many more, Reese Hoskins will not be booed. Reese Hoskins will, in fact, get a standing ovation when he comes back to Philadelphia. I also think a little reverse psychology was in play with Reese Hoskins. Like, if I put it into the atmosphere, maybe people will absolutely do the do the opposite. A little reverse psychology uh, for Reese Hoskins. Let's get to the chat check and see how you guys are doing on this fine, fine morning. April leading it off. Good morning, April. T-Bro. I know. I know. Dealer time. Miss Guzzi. Sean Kilrain. Good morning. Good morning. Sean Kilrain. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. IBH, what's going on? James Alexander. Good morning. Fletcher Cox is a legend. Absolutely. Another victory for the Sixers last night over the Pistons. Hells yeah. Fletcher is second only to Reggie White. We've been privileged to have him here for his entire career. For me, defensively, Lawrence Taylor and Reggie White are the two greatest defensive players ever. LT obviously won a couple Super Bowls there with the Giants, so I think he gets the edge. Uh, Reggie, unfortunately, only won one Super Bowl, and that was with the Packers. We all remember that, don't we? Jerome Brown didn't get his whole career. Yeah. Clyde Simmons still pretty damn good. <laughs> I don't know. Talk about defensive linemen. I mean, Jason Bat. I'm kidding. All right, anyway. Uh, yeah, I think you're dead on, IBH. I think you're dead on. Ari! Whoa, Ari! You chimed in on the post game show last night after the Sixers game. I didn't see it till after the show. I'm sorry. Uh, and you're up already. Hey, Ari, nice to see you. April, uh, that JT play. By the way, Ari, what the hell, Sonny Gray? What the hell? April, that JT play was so scary. He never leaves. I think about that a lot. You don't see it anymore with catchers because they a lot of them wear the goalie masks now. But um, the I, I, you don't see anyone really wearing the the. The throat guard. 
that's one thing I've I've thought about. I mean, you never really see it happen, but peace of mind. You might see JT out there next time with it. All right, feel bad for JT. You don't ever want to see it. Yeah, I agree. Sean Cohen, damn, that curveball caught JT right in the throat. Glad all is well. Yeah, just we'll see if he's back in the lineup today. If they don't give him a day off, I, I, I hope he's back in the lineup, of course. Uh, Lance Lynn's throwing tonight for the uh, Cardinals. A uh, little scary moment, by the way, with, with Lil Toots. Uh, I was catching up on the Phillies game uh, earlier this morning, and she caught up, or she wakes up, you know, crazy early now. And, uh, well, now she's done it before. You guys have seen her. She's literally been here. But uh, she she comes down, and I'm watching the Phillies and Cardinals uh, extended highlights. And she goes, she goes, Daddy, what's that? What's that team? She points to the Cardinals. Now, where we live, for whatever reason, we just get a lot of Cardinals in our yard. And uh, my wife thinks she's Cinderella, and we'll try to talk to the Blue Jays and the Cardinals. And I'm like, well, I hate the Blue Jays. All right. I at least respect the Cardinals. But but, uh, but Lil Touch is like, Car Daddy, I love the Cardinals. I'm like, no, 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 that are in our yard. That's you don't like this baseball team. We don't like this baseball team. We respect this baseball team. They got a great history in baseball, but we don't like them. So I had to put a little teaching moment there, a little father teaching moment, father daughter teaching moment. April, you're not going to get get this one past me this time. Thirty seven in a row. <laughs> yeah, on the way to the parking lot too. Go figure. Uh, if you know, you know. If you know, you know. Uh, morning, Daz. How are you? Phillies bat stink. Yes, they do, Daz, unfortunately. Ari Fletch is a legend. He will be missed. Absolutely. Daniel, morning. Morning to you. Getting out the Alcia from D.C. to New York. Or oh, Excella. Jeez. Uh, in a few. Oh, wow. Look at you, you East Coaster. Babs! Oh, Ari, wait. We'll wave, wave at you guys when I pass by. There you go, Ari. Babs, good morning. The Phillies are usually score some runs when Nola pitches. Yeah, maybe maybe this will be the theme this year. Uh, Wheeler gets no run support, and Nola will get run support. I'll go ahead and cross my fingers for that one. Sean Gillespie, what's popping? Daz, Kirk, uh, Cox deserves Hall of Fame. Uh, he was the second-best defensive lineman for 10 years in the league. I agree. That's why I think he eventually gets in. Fuji. I texted you back, bro. What's up, Fuji? Good morning. Sean Cohen, one memory for me is Fletcher, total domination of the one-man sled in training camp. I knew he would be a force to be reckoned with with that technique, Farzi. That, watching those guys move the sled at training camp is phenomenal. There's no Tyler. There's only Zuli. That's hilarious. What's up? End of the season collapses. Flyers just told the Eagles, hold my beer. What is happening? Crawley? Is it K. Crawley or Crawley? I guess it's Crawley. What's up? Uh, if the Sixers get the six seed, they could uh, make out in the second, make it out of the second round. Yes, they could. John Gillespie, Patrick Beverly could score now. Go figure. Okay, Babs, this is kind of where I'm at. In terms of the Eagles and the Flyers, totally disagree. Eagles had championship aspirations, and they embarrassed themselves for almost two months in comparison to the Flyers. I agree with you, Babs. The only thing I'll say is like I didn't expect anything from the Flyers this year. I expected the Eagles to compete for a Super Bowl, and the Eagles made it to ten and one. And in that ten and one, other than how I felt after the Miami game, I never really felt like the Eagles were ready to win a Super Bowl. Flyers, I went through. I went. I, I look going into the year. I was like, give me meanings, meaningful games in April. I got meaningful games in April, and uh, they didn't win any of them, but they were meaningful. <laughs> they were meaningful. Uh, Tinker Topper, that's Tinker Topper, Topper influence. You're right, Go Sixers. Uh, that umpire strike zone was atrocious last night. I can't judge. I didn't see enough of the game to judge the strike zone, but I'll take your word for it considering they have been terrible. Who was the umpire last night? It's one thing I do, especially if I'm doing the post-game show. I did Sixers responsibility. I'll do Phillies today after the 135 start time. One thing I always check out is their umpire. 
Vic Carapazza was last night. It was two nights ago. Who was last night? Alex McKay. Oh, okay. Whatever. Whatever. I'll take your word for the strike zone. has been pretty erratic the last two games for the Phillies. Three games now, if you include last night. Uh, he's not getting booed. Daz, thank you. Clemens is playing outfield in AAA left field with pop. Interesting. Really? Cody Clemens started hit with pop? All right. He was in he was in the analytics guy era. Yeah. <laughs> uh Babs, I uh I bet Hoskins won't try the late slide dirty play here in Philly. Yeah, probably not. Oh, Babs, yes. Pat Burrell had the most home runs against the Mets. He absolutely killed the Mets, but in terms of like I I don't think like, I think Pat Burrell, like if you're a Mets fan, I think if you were to talk to a Mets fan and you said, Who are the three Phillies you hate the most? I think they go, Oh, Chase Utley, Reese Hoskins. And then they probably go, Pat Burrell hit a lot of home runs against us. And that's probably where it ends. But they I don't think they hate Pat Burrell. I think they have a venom for Chase Utley. I think they have a venom for Reese Hoskins. And I think they're just like, damn, Pat Burrell killed us. I will never forget Billy Wagner. Uh, it was a game-winning home run at Old Shea Stadium that Pat Burrell hit off Billy Wagner. I'll never forget after the game, Billy Wagner said, Pat Burrell has that one swing, and I threw it right at his barrel. And I'm like, yeah, or that, or he just barreled your ass up there, Billy. Uh, Wait, I agree uh, with Farzi, LT, then Reggie. Yeah, I mean, I think – I don't even think it's much of a debate as much as I love Reggie. All right, Sneaky Sunny? What? Oh, Sunny Gray. Sorry, yeah. Uh, who is the emergency catcher? That's a great question. Schwarber was a catcher. Harper was obviously a catcher. Um, that's a great question. I wonder who would be the emergency catcher, because I doubt either one of those guys want to catch. I would. I'm going to go ahead and say it's going to be Schwarber. I'm going to say Kyle Schwarber will be the emergency catcher for the Phils, unless they bring, unless they bring, uh, they bring somebody in. Well, Stubbs is the backup catcher. We're talking about the emergency catcher. Basically, it's like the punter playing quarterback in football. Uh, Ari, sending Lil Toots tons of Cardinals gear. You bite your tongue, Ari. You bite your tongue. Jimmy Rollins, the team to beat, quote. Yeah, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. Dad Stubbs, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. You guys are wonderful as per usual. All right. No, I don't think there's anything going on in the world. Let's get to the morning rush brought to you by Sky Motorcars, skymotorcars.com. I don't think there's anything in the NBA worth bragging about tonight for the Sixers standing-wise. Oh, wait, the Cavs might be in action tonight, and I think they are. They were off last night. What's today? Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Yeah, Cavaliers play the Grizzlies in Cleveland, so that'll be a win for Cleveland. Anybody else? The Heat are in action tonight, 7.30 tip-off, so they got the back-to-back -back with the Dallas Mavericks. That smells like a loss to me. And Milwaukee's got Orlando. Oh, so the Sixers are catching Orlando on a back-to-back. -back. That's good because the Sixers, they tip off with the Magic Thursday night. How exciting and wonderful is that? Wait a minute. What the hell am I looking at here? I'm sorry, they tip off Friday. Scoozy. Uh, so, am I looking at this right? Yeah, they tip off Friday uh, with Orlando. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzi Show presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Uh, I'll be on with you guys again later this afternoon after the Phillies 115 start time against the St. Louis Cardinals. I'll be on the um, 
Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Go over there right now before you watch Birds 365 here on Jacob. Go ahead, uh, watch, uh, watch that. Uh, but go ahead and subscribe to Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Big game in Philly. We're talking about it post game. Sixers game, obviously, tomorrow or Friday, excuse me. Uh, and then we also have the um, uh, Phillies today. So make sure you check me out over there. Uh, that's the Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Coming up in 30 minutes. It's a good thing about starting late. It's a better lead in for Birds 365 on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Farzee Show YouTube channel. And I'll be right with the world. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. My name is Mark Farzetta. Catch you guys later this afternoon.